So my name is Anna Romanoff. I am a postdoctoral fellow here at the Sydney Mathematical Research Institute and I have been here for two years since the Institute started and I am working with Professor Jordi Williamson who's one of the directors and I came here from the United States on an American government grant to work on a project with Jordi. So generally my research is in a field of math called representation theory and slightly more specifically I study the representation theory of Lie groups. So what representation theory is, is it's more of a language. It's a tool for studying symmetry. And Lie groups are a certain type of symmetry. So symmetry is something that we all sort of understand. We have some notion of what it means to be symmetric in the world. Um, for example, a, a butterfly is symmetric because the patterns on one side of its wing align with the patterns on the other side of its wing when it flaps its wings. So a butterfly has a um, reflective symmetry across this axis through its body. But something like a circle is also symmetric because if we have a circle and we rotate it any amount, it looks the same before and after the rotation. Um, and what I do is I study these types of symmetries using a certain mathematical language. And some, some, some objects have more symmetry than other objects. For example, the, the circle is much more symmetric than the butterfly. The butterfly only has the symmetry of flapping its wings, whereas the circle we can rotate any amount. So the butterfly has one symmetry, where the circle has infinitely many symmetries. And even more than infinitely many symmetries, the circle has symmetries which change continuously. So we could rotate by 10 degrees, and that's a symmetry of the circle. Or we could rotate by 1 degree, or by 0.01 degree, or 0.0001 degree. And because of this, if we look at all the symmetries of the circle, these change continuously. And collections of continuously changing symmetries form something called a Lie group. And these are the objects that I study in my research. So when you were an undergraduate, you got interested in a project on bicycles with oddly shaped wheels. Can you tell me a bit about how that came about and uh, where that led? Yeah, so, so this is a fun project that I hadn't thought about in many years until recently, and now it's come back into my life. Um, but it was really a delightful little thing that I played with for a few months. So I was taking a class as an undergraduate on differential geometry. And this class had a, had a final project, and the teacher gave us a lot of freedom into what we could do our final project on. And a friend and I decided, I don't really know why, but somehow we decided that what we wanted to do for this project was we wanted to design a bicycle that could run smoothly down the stairs. And so, so what I mean by that is if you, if you think about just riding a normal bicycle down the stairs, it would not be smooth at all. It would sort of block, chump, chump. It'd be a terrible experience to ride a bicycle downstairs. But you could imagine that you could design a wheel shape so that the wheel actually runs smoothly on the stairs. And to do this, you would have to think about the stairs as just sort of a, a zigzag, like a 90 degree zigzag. And then you could think about a shape so that the very center of the wheel rolls perfectly horizontally. And so as the, as the wheel rolls, its shape is kind of exactly the inverse shape to the stairs, and the bicycle can move without actually doing the blocky thing. So this is something, so my, my uh, classmate and I decided that this is something we wanted to do for this differential geometry project. We wanted to figure out what shape wheel we would need so that our bicycle could run smoothly down the stairs without, um, without having us fall off. <laughs> And, and what we figured out was, well, we derived the shape. It's kind of a funny shape. It looks a bit like a flower. It sort of goes like this. And you can imagine that happening because you can imagine if you have a point like this, which is the angle of the stairs, for it to run smoothly here, you need something that's sort of a, an arc shape and then has to hit the bottom and come back up again. So, so what we came up with was this flower shape, which was the complement to the stairs. And then after doing this, we wanted to take this further because it was fun to design this. So we decided to physically build a bicycle that had these shape of wheels and try to run it down a track that we had made that was a zigzag like some stairs and see if it ran smoothly. And so then I spent several months um, with power tools and plywood building these wheels and attaching them to an old bicycle frame. At the time, I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, where there are lots of bicycles around. <laughs> um, so we built this bicycle and it worked. It ran, it ran smoothly on the stairs and it was very fun. Um, it was a, a great project. It had some really beautiful and fun math and it was also just kind of a quirky thing to figure out. But then I hadn't thought about this in maybe over 10 years since I had done this project. Um, 
But recently, uh, last year, I was contacted by Randall Monroe, who is the author of the comic XKCD, and he was writing a new book called How To, about curiosities in the world and how to do ridiculous things. And he had stumbled upon this, um, this project that I had done back as an undergraduate, and he was so excited to see it because it was exactly the same thing that he was trying to derive for something that he was working on in this book. And so this made me draw back the old project and think about what we had done, and now there's a very cute little comic of our flower-wheeled bicycle showing up in this new book by Randall Munro. Um, so my path was not so intentional to mathematics. I really did not think I was going to be a mathematician when I was young. Um, in fact, I didn't know that you could be a mathematician. I had no idea that this was a job that people could have. And so I just went about school. Um, I'm from the United States originally. I grew up in the western United States in a pretty small town, so I didn't know any mathematicians. Um, but I went through school and I always liked math, but I thought that it was a little bit boring actually. I didn't think it was very interesting. I thought it was pretty algorithmic. I was taught how to compute things and do these processes through an algorithm. And it didn't really capture my imagination very much. Um, but when I started university, I had no idea what I wanted to study. And I remember sitting in the kitchen with my mom when I was filling out the forms to start university and asking her, what am I supposed to major in? What do I like? And she said, well, I don't know. What classes do you like? And I said, well, I like my math class, and I like my English class, but math seems more practical, so I'll study math. And so I wrote down on this form that I was going to study math, and I intended to change my major later, actually. I assumed that I would change it. Um, but then I never did. So I started university, and I started taking these math classes. And the more classes I took, the more beautiful it got. And suddenly I realized for the first time that it didn't have to be algorithmic. So I started taking these classes where we'd study these interesting objects in multiple dimensions, and we'd prove things. And suddenly it didn't feel like I was just following a set of rules anymore. It felt like it was something creative and beautiful and like I was exploring. And so I started really enjoying math. But at the same point in time, I didn't know what I could possibly do with it. And so towards the end of my undergraduate degree, I had, I had professors reach out to me and say, oh, well, have you thought about going to graduate school? And at this time, I actually still didn't really know what graduate school was. I didn't know that you could keep going. But since my professors had suggested it, I thought that this seemed like a good option. And I did, wasn't sure what else to do with math. And so I went on and went to graduate school. And then it was really in graduate school that I started, when I started doing mathematics research for the first time, that I realized what a good fit this was for me. And I found the research to be challenging and beautiful and interesting and really creative in a way that I hadn't expected. Um, and, and so then I continued through graduate school and I finished my PhD and now I'm continuing down this path, being a mathematician. So it was a little bit of an accident, but a happy accident. Very happy to have ended up here. Yeah, so careers in mathematics are sort of funny. I didn't know this when I was getting into it either, that they have a lot of stages. So, so your first stage is to finish a bachelor's degree, which I did, and then in the United States, you go straight from bachelor's degree to a PhD, and then you finish a PhD. And then when you finish a PhD, you don't automatically become a professor. After this, there are a few intermediary phases, and that's where I am right now. Um, so I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher, and I'm on a two-year two position. And then after this, I will complete another postdoctoral position. So this will be another temporary position at a different university. And after this, I will apply for permanent positions somewhere. And so once I've done these temporary positions, these will set me up in a good position to be able to develop my own research program and settle down somewhere permanently. And this, this structure of mathematics um, is a little bit wild because it has you moving all over the world every few years, but it's also very exciting. It gives you this great opportunity to move to different parts of the world and interact with different people and learn their perspectives of math for a few years, and then go somewhere else and to a different part of the world and a different group of people and learn their perspectives of math for a few years. And then once you've collected all these different perspectives, then you're at a stage where you can settle down in your permanent home and become a professor and build a program with students and postdocs and kind of develop your own sense of mathematics. So currently I'm hoping that this will happen in maybe three or four years from now. I'll have some permanent position somewhere and it's unclear at this point in time where it'll be. It might be in the United States, it might be in Australia, it might be in Europe. Um, mathematics has the wonderful quality of being a very international world and so it's hard to know where you'll end up. There's active mathematics in my research area all over the world and lots of exciting people to talk to. How has this all changed in the times of COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> it has changed quite a lot, <laughs> um, but both in good ways and bad ways. I've been reflecting on this a little bit lately, and everything shutting down is, is very challenging 
if for a lot of well a lot of sectors all over the world but in academia it's challenging because you lose the, the contact with people um, but there have been a lot of silver linings that i think have been good for math so the main challenges come from the fact that i like to do math very collaboratively and uh, in general, I think a lot of mathematicians do this as well. Math is a very social thing. Math gets done by, by talking. It doesn't really get done by sitting alone and thinking so often. Most of the most productive times are when you're talking to somebody else or working on a project with somebody else. And before COVID, I had a very social mathematical life in that I'm here at the Sydney Mathematical Research Institute and I share an office with some other postdocs and I have research lunches with my research group every week and we have seminars and we have visitors. And so normally I would have a lot of interaction with different mathematicians and we'd constantly be talking about math or I'd be hearing about math. And I really loved this and this was very productive. And so when we all went to our homes and everything got shut down, suddenly all of this social contact was cut off. But it was only cut off briefly before it transitioned to being online social contact. And online social mathematics is still, is still good. We can still talk, we still have research lunches that are happening online, we still have seminars that are happening online, but it does cut out some of these useful middle times. Um, what are the times that's, that's most productive for mathematicians are the times that are before and after a seminar. And so often, if you go to a seminar in person, you walk to the seminar with people, and then you sit down and listen to the seminar, and then you leave the seminar with people. And in those in-between times are when you have casual conversations that are often about math. And these casual conversations are something that are missing from this online life that I found. Um, so this is a way that it's been kind of challenging during COVID. But a positive aspect of this new online system is that now we can attend seminars or anyone can attend seminars from anywhere in the world. So I, I run a seminar um, based out of Simri, and the seminar used to meet in person for the last two years, and now it's shifted to meeting online. And since it started meeting online, all of these new people have started attending our seminar. So now we have students and postdocs and professors from the United States and from Canada and from Europe who are all attending these seminars together and from other parts of Australia as well. And this has been really fruitful. And so suddenly it's broadened the amount of people who I can speak to, and it's brought some really interesting insight into these seminars. So I think that the, the global nature of an online system is beneficial, though it certainly lacks some of the social contact that we had before.